Okay, uh, I'm talking to Jordan Ellenberg, who just, uh, not just, uh, wrote a book called... How Not To Be Wrong. How Not To Be Wrong. And uh, yeah, tell us about your book. Well, um, <laughs> it's a book I wrote about math, but not so much the kind of math that I do as a researcher. It mostly focuses on actually math that's a lot older. Um, I guess I am imagining people reading it who um, maybe took math in school but never really were told why they were doing that or what the point of that mathematics was. And I try to make the case of the book that mathematical thinking is part of everything that we do, even if we don't label it as such. I mean, I think there's a lot of things we do that are mathematical that we don't think of as mathematical. So what would be a nice example to illustrate that? Do you have something in introduction I was told? Well, yeah, one example I start the book with, which is a very beautiful one, is about um, a guy called Abraham Wald, who was a uh, well, he's a statistician, but he actually starts as a point set topologist, a very austere, pure mathematician. But he comes uh, to America and gets interested in statistics and economics. And he, um, he's working at the top secret installation uh, in New York during World War II. Um, some of the best mathematicians and statisticians in America were sort of like working on war problems. And what happens is that a bunch of generals come to this institution, the Statistical Research Group, or, SR or SRG, and they say, We've noticed that planes, when they come back from their missions on Germany, um, they're covered with bullet holes, but there's more bullet holes in some parts of the plane than others. It's like more bullet holes in the fuselage and less on the engines. And they wanted to know if there was some kind of mathematical formula that could tell them how much more armor they had to put on the parts of the plane that were getting hit more. I mean, this is kind of some kind of optimization problem where you want to allocate the resources you have, the armor you have, uh, to protect the planes most efficiently. Um, and what Walt told them was something that they found quite surprising. He said, you have to put the armor where the bullet holes are not. You have to put it on the engine, not on the fuselage. So this was quite surprising to them. But what Walt explained was that it's not that the Germans couldn't hit their planes on the engines. It's that the planes that got hit on the engines were the ones that were not coming back from Germany. And I, and I like this story because he didn't really give them the kind of answer they expected. He didn't give them that formula. He didn't give them that equation. He didn't give them that number. And the stereotype is that that's what a mathematician does, right? They sort of are asked a question and they provide right. a numerical answer. Um, what he did is, in fact, I think something rather, much more mathematical than that, that he sort of tried to figure out whether they were asking the right question or whether the question had underlying assumptions in it, and if so, whether those assumptions were correct. Um, in this case, you could say that the assumption is that the planes returning were something like a random sample of planes that had flown missions, which they were decidedly not. So where did you um, get your um, sources? I mean, you, you've been reading about things of this sort for over the years, or investigated particularly for the book? Yeah, well, well, it was a mix. It's funny, I think I started out with some ideas of what I wanted to write about, but as you start to research, I mean, you know, the very nature of math, and this is one reason I was excited to write a book, something long, I mean, I've written a lot of articles, um, but in, in a book, you can really explore the way all of math touches every other part of math. It's all connected into the surface. Um, so when you start studying one thing to write about one story, you find that it connects to another story and another story, and it sort of branches out. So actually, originally, I think I proposed, my, in the proposal I wrote when I was selling the book in the first place, I had 18 chapters I was going to do. And at some point, I had to call the publisher and say, well, I've written three of the chapters, and I have 300 pages. <laughs> so, so I said, do you want an 1800 page book five years from now or do you more want me just to write five of these and unsurprisingly they said like no we want you to write five of these and turn it in on time so that was certainly so i learned a lot writing it actually and what ends up being the book tons of stuff that wall story included that i didn't set out to write about but that i found out about just as i was sort of following trails of math that's so nice so it must have been a, quite an interesting experience for you yourself as a, as a mathematician as a person in general you know exactly i mean I, I guess maybe one way of saying it is i set out to write about stuff i already knew which would have been easier but it turns out it's not that interesting to write about stuff you already know it's more fun to learn stuff and so i found myself every time i had an opportunity to sort of follow some trail and learn about some piece of mathematical history or even some piece of mathematics i didn't know anything about um I took it and tried to, uh, to some extent, to try to like portray that energy of like learning something you're excited about, like you know, onto the page. Great. Uh, so Jordan Eilerberg is a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and he's also written a book uh, that is not on math. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. So a long time ago, before I before I went to grad school, even after college, I went to uh, I went to writing school. I went to a master's program in creative writing, and I wrote a novel called The Grasshopper King. Um, which is 
let's just say a lot fewer people have read it than have read the math book. <laughs> well, maybe that will change. <laughs> <laughs> so, and um, your book has been translated to many uh, languages. As we know, you're going to have a book, is, uh, what's the word? Uh, book yeah, an opening, event, I guess. Event, uh, yeah. Today, we are at uh, both at a, a conference at IMPA in Brazil, uh, and uh, this is the event in uh, the Portuguese edition of your book. Exactly. There's actually going to be a Portuguese edition in Portugal as well, which is a separate translation as the Portuguese edition in Brazil. Um, this is the first translation to come out, and the next one will be the Italian version, which is coming out, I think, July 16th. Let's see if I can say the title. It's um, Inumeri non spalio mai. Which means numbers don't lie. That's the, that's the N- uh, numbers never, oh, never make lie. mistakes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Sounds good. Um, so, what's uh, what's up uh, on the, in your plate? You have more projects, or what's what's? Uh... Well, now I'm really trying to finish all the theorems that I didn't finish while I was writing this 500-page <laughs> book. So, um, so I'm cleaning my plate, and um, you know. Uh, Fernando, you and I are here at this conference at IMPA in Brazil, like learning about number theory and physics, and it's all pretty awesome. Okay, well, thanks very lot, uh, Jordan, and look best of luck for your book and so on, and uh, I'll keep you posted. Maybe I'll come contact you again for something else. Awesome, thanks, Fernando. Yeah, ciao.